Hi, I'm Paul, and this is The Golf Show. I'm Paul Hemlin. Welcome to episode 7 of The Golf Show. On The Golf Show this week, we've got European Tour player Chris Hansen teaching us how to read and aim a putt like a pro. We've got our regular rules feature and we've got giveaways galore. I'm going to give away one of Rory McIlroy's signed Nike shirts and also Chris has kindly given us one of these yardage books that he used when he was on tour. He signed it and we're going to give this away. Okay, I really hope you're all enjoying The Golf Show. I'm really enjoying making it and it's been great to get some lovely comments back from all of you. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. It really helps me out. Please just press that button there and subscribe and turn on the notifications and that way you're not going to miss any of the great content we're putting out each week. But that's enough from me. Let's get on with the golf show. I'd like to take two minutes to talk to you about golf insurance. Now, maybe not the most interesting subject, but if your clubs get stolen, I'm sure it's going to get your attention. And there are five things that you need to think about when you're taking out a policy for golf insurance. So the first is if your equipment is stolen. Okay, now there are some caveats to that. It doesn't count as theft if you've left them in a, a clubhouse locker room, unattended, not secured, after a game of golf. Your clubs won't be insured if they're stolen from your car overnight. Okay, and when you come in to insure your equipment, don't just think about the value of your clubs. You've got a bag, you're probably going to have a GPS device, you've waterproofs, 50 quid with the golf balls, all the other stuff in your bag besides the hardware. So make sure when you're taking out a policy, you're looking at um, the relevant level of cover and normally there is sort of a sliding scale with the insurers depending on how much your equipment is. Um, you will have to notify your insurer within a certain amount of time if your clubs are stolen. Now after theft the next thing you want to think about is loss. So maybe you, um, you've left a club um, perhaps by the side of a hole, things like that. Again you need receipts and there's a relevant sort of notification period. Um, accidental damage is a, an important area to look at as well. What if you break your trolley, your power trolley or your clubs? Again, there could be limits on the amount you could recover. Um, you will need a receipt. Again, you can see where I'm going here. It's really important to keep these receipts. Um, a credit card statement may not be adequate evidence of, of, the, of what you've got. Um, public liability is another important thing where if you damaged um, somebody's property or if you hurt somebody, they may claim for compensation. There was a golfer in Scotland a year or two ago who unfortunately was blinded in one eye and he got £400,000 compensation, which an insurance policy would pay out if you had one. Now, there are caveats to this as well. If you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol or if you maliciously hit a golf ball at somebody, obviously you wouldn't be covered. Um, but it's not all bad news as well. Golf insurance typically includes hole-in-one cover. So if you get an ace one day, that would be covered, but the insurance will be valid for a certain amount. I think my policy is for about 60 quid, and you would need to buy that round of drinks for everybody on the day that you got your ace. Okay, I hope that was helpful, and I really would encourage you to think about taking out some golf insurance. So now we're going to talk about the infamous green box. As an amateur, I've not really seen one of these, but you see the pros on the telly using them all the time. And what you've got in these green box is some, some charts that show you the slopes on the green and percentage of those slopes. So we're going to have a chat with Chris and see how Chris would use these on the course. Okay Chris, so now we're going to have a chat about green books which we see all the time on the telly, not something that we see in the amateur game, obviously um, we're seeing pros using them a lot and yeah. it does feel from watching a lot of golf tournaments on television that some pros are really over reliant on these things, bit of a safety blanket. Yeah certainly, I think um, obviously first things first, they're not cheap either, these are between 50 and 100 pound to buy at a tour yeah. event, they're not giving away. I know some players, I think extensive had the companies doing their own books okay. separate from the tour and we're paying thousands of pounds for wow. them to actually pot them themselves. Yeah. I don't agree with them, yep. but it's never been, it hasn't, it was never banned when I was on tour yeah. and it was a tool what I felt was an aid, so I used it. Okay, um, for what reason wouldn't you agree with it? I just think it takes away the skill of actually green reading yeah. and hitting putts, which is a skill in itself, isn't yeah. it? Okay. Some people aren't good at that, so all of a sudden this gives them a bit of a Okay. Yeah. Bit of a way out, really, from that skill. Okay. The, the, there's a lot of detail. It's very confusing to someone if they just picked it up and looked at it. I used to really highlight the big yep. slopes. Um, this just shows you some of the greens at St Andrews at 15 degrees, is degrees of slopes. Wow. And you've got some greens at St Andrews, obviously 100 yards long, and the double greens. What I used to use them for personally, I did do numerous aim point sessions with yep. a guy called Jamie Donaldson, who was the guy in the UK who ran that. Yep. 
and it gave me a lot of knowledge. That's another skill in itself and was quite hard for me personally to feel yep. the slopes. Yep. You know, people stand on, on a slope and yep. that might be a one slope or a two slope. And it was a lot of time to practice yep. that. Uh, so then all of a sudden these came out and for me it was, well, you've got the answers here. Yep. And then I used the end point strategy yep. from there. So got a bit of a slope. Yep. Obviously this is St. Andrew, so we can't use this. Yep. But what we have got is we've got a, a spirit level. So I think you can get percentage and you can get another on a degree, but we want percent. Yeah. So what you would do is if it was um, if it's one slope all the way, double breakers are a total another yeah. story, but it's one plane. So this is one right to left put, you can see that. So from say 10, yeah. 12 feet, I would take the middle third there and, and get an idea. And that, that's a 6% slope there. Yeah. So from a 6% slope, I would stand roughly behind the ball here. And I've not got six fingers on this hand, but it would give me a a six would give me a reference of where I should actually yeah. be aiming aiming the putt. Yeah. I went through some periods where I probably relied on it too much, okay. but then when I was having tough times as well, I found it hard to pick a specific line. Sure. So the benefit for this for me was it gave you an, it gave you an aim point. You had somewhere to start, yeah. so my aim point was now a foot right of the hole, and I would adjust to that. So I'd see that as my starting read. I'd be <laughs> like, right, yeah, there's my, my 12 inches right of the hole. Do I agree with it? Yes. I'm going to go with that now. I really struggled on the golf course trying to feel yeah. a 1% slope or a 2% slope, yeah. yeah. Whereas on a big slope, quite easy. And in a practice round when you're at a European Tour event, would you spend a lot of time on the green to get this kind of kit out there and, and work out? Because of you travelling from different countries, different types of grass, different slopey greens, flat greens? Yeah, yeah. I had a little uh, a practice aid where you'd set it up with different footage of putts and they matched up to different aim points. So you could hit different putts on different distances and just get a good feel. That's, and that's an interesting point there, because I have seen guys at the golf club use it. Where I play at Fulford and York, the greens are pretty flat. There's only one or two big breaks. But, and I see guys you know, doing the one or the two fingers, but, and, and I get the science behind it, but they've probably never calibrated that and actually yeah. worked out you know, from eight foot behind what one finger to the right actually looks like and yeah. what, what the, the result's going to be. Is you could either stand further away from the ball and have a straight arm, yeah. Or well, some people stayed static and, and, and actually moved their, their hands. Obviously, the closer it came, the, the bigger the, so the I gap suspect, came. As, as amateurs do, when we, <laughs> instead of taking a little bit of medicine, we take the whole bottle. Yeah. You know, there's people out there doing it, but they're not doing it correctly. Yeah, probably not. But, but to, in their defence, yeah. it might still work for them because yeah. it gives them... As long as they're consistent with what they're doing and... and it gives them a point to commit to, whereas yeah. it goes back to you saying, do you commit to... A line, or do you just and, and hit a, a good put on the wrong line, yep. or do you hit a bad put? Interesting. Whereas now, even if they get this wrong or right, they've gone right. Um, it's an inch right. Yeah. So then they hit this put with some yep. conviction, right. really. So what sort of um, for this put here? What would sort of the sort of aim point read be for this one? Yeah. So that was a six percent slope there, wasn't yep. it? So I would I would look at that. I'd, I know that's a six slope. Yep. So for me personally, I'd just be like, right, that's a lot of slope. Yeah. Okay. So it just make me aware that I do need to be yep. even more so high side here yep. and there's going to be some speed in it. Okay. Even I've got five, I've got four good fingers here so we're going to go, I'm going to go four. It's well, giving me a guide, it's saying right Chris there's a lot of break on here, I need to really be high side. Yeah. I've just got my awareness here that I'm a lot further right than I, than I originally would. Yeah, oh, was pace was pretty good. So yeah, so that's one of the keys how, why I would use it. On long put say you had a St Andrews 30 yard put on on plane so it was all right to left yep. majority of people would look at that and go yep it's right to left it's a yard maybe right of the hole but as soon as you know it's a six slope or something yep. and you put six fingers up at 30 yards yep. all of a sudden it's five yards it's right, right yeah. to left and not one yard so really interesting excellent Thanks for that, Chris. Yeah, cool. The golf show has already had more than 10,000 minutes watched on YouTube in just our first five episodes, which is amazing. My next goal is to get us to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, and for that I need your help. So it's competition time. We're going to have our 1K giveaway. Once the YouTube golf show channel gets 1,000 subscribers, I'm going to pick one at random and send them this Rory McIlroy signed Nike golf shirt. This is actually one of Rory's own shirts. Take a look at that. Custom fit. No worries about small, medium, or large, eh? So all you need to do is subscribe to the Golf Show's YouTube channel. Subscription is free. If you can tell your friends, we're going to get to a thousand subscribers sooner. And then I will put one at random and I will ship this shirt anywhere in the world. 
Best of luck. Okay, I've just got to my approach shot and it's plugged. Or as they say in the rules of golf, it's an embedded ball. This is going to happen during winter to all of us, so it's important we know what rights we've got and what relief we can take. Now, you will get relief if your ball is in the general area of the course. The general area would exclude the teeing ground, a bunker, penalty area, or if it's on the wrong green. You also won't get relief if your ball's plugged, but it's in the middle of a bush. To get relief, your ball must be in its own pitch mark from the shot you've just played, or it must be beneath ground level. So clearly that's what I've got here. Okay, so I get in tight onto a drop. But you've got to take the nearest point of relief from there. Okay, so I'm literally just a few inches behind the ball. I drop it down, that's behind, that's okay. I'm good to go. Hi guys, Chris Hansen here. Got a quick question for you. In which year did I play in the Open Championships?